The two sentence summary of my book uh, is that uh, China's decades long reform era, the period of Gaiga Kaifeng, is ending. Uh, and economically, ideologically, and politically, China is moving into a new post reform era that differs dramatically from what we've known since the late 1970s. In this talk, I'm going to set out the broad overall argument of the book uh, and explain why I'm worried. Uh, but I'm specifically going to focus on the political dimension, what's happening politically in China, uh, and, ex uh, and explain how China is experiencing erosion of its uh, political norms and practices, reform era norms and practices. So let me start with a brief overview. It kind of helps to remember, for thinking about the reform era, it helps to remember what came before. For the first three decades of uh, the People's Republic of China, namely the Maoist era, China looked like this. Economically, it was stagnant. Uh, pervasive rural poverty and a failed state-run economic model had left the country by 1978 with a per capita GDP lower than that of India and lower than that of Zaire. Uh, ideologically, China was relatively closed to the outside world. Not only were Western capitalist and Soviet revisionist practices decried, but uh, all religions and Chinese, uh, Chinese tradition itself were ruthlessly suppressed in the name of socialist modernization. Uh, and so the picture on the lower left there is basically the burning of uh, temple, temples and art, temple artifacts uh, as part of some of the radical movements that took place in the 1960s. Uh, and politically, the third dimension, politically China was unstable. Power was highly concentrated in the hands of a single leader, namely Mao Zedong. Uh, and on the level of elite politics, uh, he had a tendency to purge his designated successors, uh, one of whom, Liu Shaoqi, died uh, after a beating in a prison cell, and the second, uh, Lin Biao, who uh, died in a mysterious plane crash in Mongolia while apparently fle fleeing to the Soviet Union after a failed coup. That's kind of what happens in you know, elite politics when the rules of the game are essentially the rules of the jungle. Uh, within society at large, Mao preferred ruling through disruptive street movements and political campaigns that targeted his enemies of the day and called out you know, students to uh, attack uh, his political opponents, rather than relying on the regular institutions of governance, such as uh, law or such as the party, uh, party regulations itself. In fact, Communist Party and government institutions themselves dissolved during the decade-long period of chaos known as the Cultural Revolution from 1966 to 1976. And of course, you know, some of you weren't remotely alive at that point. So, you know, just I include a couple photos. I mean, this was, I believe, if I have it correct, this is the political commissar of one of the Southwest military of the Southwest military region who's being dragged out and put into the airplane position by radical students who are, you know, targeting, basically tearing apart uh, institutions and governance. Uh, and that's an example of, you know, how at that period, how, it, you know, radical and how unstable uh, China was. Okay, now we move on to the second period. Uh, for the second three decades of the People's Republic of China, the reform era, namely the period that we think of as Gaiga Kaifeng, China looked very different. Economically, China experienced decades uh, of rapid economic growth. Market reforms that were launched in the 1980s led China to average 10% GDP growth year after year for three decades. And in the 1980s in particular, this was broad-based growth that lifted all boats, particularly those of the rural poor. Ideologically, China opened up. In Deng Xiaoping's famous words, it doesn't matter if a cat is black or white, as long as it catches mice, it's a good cat. Uh, and of course, you know, that is a mantra which says, you know, we may technically be a socialist system, but in fact, pragmatically, will do whatever shows positive results. And within the Chinese state and within schools, that type of pragmatic attitude gave a whole host of actors latitude to freely import concepts and practices from abroad. But that ideological openness wasn't lim limited to sort of looking outside. It was also an attitude that existed with regard to Chinese society itself. The party backed out of people's lives. The ideological fervor of the Maoist era faded. Religion came back. Uh, uh, the uh, Muslim mosques and Christian, uh, Christian churches and Buddhist temples reopened. Socialism began to fade into a series of somewhat meaningless slogans that were recited on state television. Privately, as long as you didn't cross those core red lines of attempting to organize politically and 
you know, uh, you know, challenge party rule or circulate things directly attacking top leaders, you had a great degree of, flex of freedom to do what you wanted in your private life. That's an artifact of a, you know, a decision to sort of back a little, for the party to sort of back out of attempting to control society. Uh, quite different from the, pre the Maoist era. And politically, China's party's leaders supported the emergence during the reform era of a range of partially institutionalized political norms, in large part to address the chaos and the instability that they themselves had personally experienced during the Cultural Revolution. And when I say personally experienced, think about Deng Xiaoping. Think about his son, Deng Pufang. This was a figure, this is you know, China's top leader in the 1980s and an important figure even in the 50s and 60s. His own son during the Cultural Revolution was dragged to the third or the fifth story of a building and thrown out of a window, ended up partially paralyzed. Think about what that experience means by Red Guards, by radical Red Guards during the Cultural Revolution. Think about what that experience means if you're Deng Xiaoping coming to power in 1978 and ruling the country in the 1980s. You are absolutely committed to figure out ways to make sure that China doesn't repeat that. Uh, and so this was behind the political reforms that Deng Xiaoping and leaders like him took in the 1980s. And, uh, and to be clear, these were not political liberalization. This was not democratization. Particularly after Tiananmen, particularly after 1989, Chinese leaders drew a hard line at anything regarding democratization or, 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 or political liberalization. Rather, when I say that they took steps to partially institutionalized political norms, what I mean is the rules of the one-party game, or the, the sort of the political rules of the, of the one-party political game, became somewhat more predictable and somewhat more organized. And so a sampling of the reforms that I'm talking about would include things such as Deng Xiaoping's designation of his next two successors, namely, uh, uh, namely uh, Jiang Zemin and Hu Jintao, which ensured an unusual period of political stability in the 1990s and early 2000s. Collective leadership with power split between a range of top party leaders, each having different portfolios, rather than having power all concentrated in the hands of a single individual, such as was the case in the Maoist era. Development of internal norms regarding the regular promotion, succession, and retirement of top party leaders. Partial depoliticization of the bureaucracy, with party leaders retreating from an effort to manage the day-to-day -day affairs of state and turning over the responsibility for managing the economy, turning over the responsibility for managing the day-to-day -day affairs of you know, religion to technocrats rather than attempting to directly manage. We're still going to be on control of the you know, setting overall policy, but we're going to take a step back and give control to the technocrats and the bureaucracy for a wide range of things. Um, and uh, last, emergence of bottom-up input institutions. So the reform era sees local elections, it sees administrative law channels, it sees a partially commercialized media airing popular grievances, which gives citizens a limited degree of voice into the political process and helps contribute to state legitimacy. In short, if I'm summarizing this period that we think of as Gaiga Kaifang or reform, the reform era, it's marked by three things. Economically, rapid growth. Ideologically, a relative degree of openness, both externally and internally and politically, relative political stability marked by partial, insti partial political institutionalization. Okay, now we are entering a new period. We can, all of those three things are ending. We can debate about the precise dates. You know, I, some people, I, I'm not one of those people who think it all started with Xi Jinping. I don't think it just started in 2012. I think some of the key trends actually date a little bit earlier than that uh, to sort of the early 2000s. But the trends have become particularly clear since 2012. Economically, China is beginning to in, uh, undergo a, uh, a seismic shift. Its era of rapid growth is coming to an end. Optimists who are looking at this are saying that secular and demographic trends in the Chinese you know, aging population, uh, uh, so all of this, this is the result of secular trends that we're familiar to what happened in, say, Taiwan or Japan. And if you're an optimist, you'd say, well, that era of rapid growth is ending, but it's just going to plateau at a lower level of growth, similar to what happened in Japan and Taiwan. Um, on the other hand, there are pessimists who will flag a, 
sort of a range of issues in the Chinese economy uh, that they will say are unsustainable pressures that are building up uh, that they think could lead to a dramatic hard landing, including the buildup in debt levels. Uh, and uh, uh, so either way, doesn't matter if you're an optimist or a pessimist. The key thing is that period of rapid growth is coming to an end, and China is going to enter into a very different period from what we've known over the last three to four decades. Ideologically, uh, there's also a change. Uh, and specifically, China is gradually turning inwards on itself again. This is showing up uh, first in, this is showing up in the state, uh, in society. First, this is showing up in society. So a renewed popular interest in Confucianism, uh, a proliferation of the Hanfu Yun Dong, you know, the sort of the, the, the move, uh, sort of there's this popular move I, the photos I use are of the graduation ceremonies where, you know, in some college campuses you will find uh, students when they graduate, it's not the cap and gown, it's a reimagined version of Han, Han Dynasty clothing. Um, and so, you know, there, there are trends in society on this, uh, on this that, are, that you can sort of point to for this, this example. But it's also showing up in the state, the sort of actions that the state is taking. So, for example, Xi Jinping in 2013 goes to Chufu, which is the birthplace of Confucius, uh, and he declares that the Communist Party, uh, after having spent the better part of the 20th century attempting to wipe out Confucianism, attempting to wipe out Chinese tradition uh, in the name of socialist modernization, actually needs to pivot and to begin to re-embrace you know, uh, the traditional culture, traditional religion, and fuse party doctrine, fuse nationalism, fuse Marxist-Leninism with tradition to create a new ideology uh, governing to, to govern you know, to govern China. Now, if you're thinking about these trends, it's important to realize that there's a component, there's a part of this which is simply a renewed uh, interest on the part of uh, citizens in their own culture. Uh, many Chinese citizens are quite understandably starting to think after China has risen, shouldn't we take more of an interest in our own culture? There was a period in the 1980s and 1990s where the focus among many in society was absorbing whatever cultural import was coming from abroad. And so many people are starting to think, well, you know, it's a different era. Shouldn't we take more of an interest in our own culture? And that's a totally natural process which happens in many countries. Um, but it's important, if you're thinking about the state, it's also important to realize what the state is doing on this. Uh, there's a strategic effort on the part of China's leaders to attempt to deploy Chinese tradition, you know, as an ideological shield against foreign values, particularly Western ones. There's a sense within the party propaganda, the party elite, that the collapse of communism as an ideology uh, has left a vacuum at the heart of Chinese society. Uh, there's, uh, and, and as a result of this vacuum, there's a range of foreign ideologies that are beginning to sort of seep into the United, uh, seep into China, uh, from underground Christian house churches to Western liberal, liberalism to um, Muslim influences from over from 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 the Middle East, uh, and there's a sense among party propaganda officials that these are uh, these are infiltrating and undermining China. Uh, and so the question, if you're thinking as a party, you know, as a, as a party ideologue, one of the questions is, what do we do about this? How do we address this? And the and we need to figure out how are we going to assert an ideological response. Um, now, one response, some within the, China, within the party bureaucracy, because it is, after all, it's the Communist Party, one answer is you double down on Marxism. So for example, uh, Marx's 200th anniversary of his birth last year, uh, the party you know, had a had big celebration, you know, reissuing uh, the Communist Manifesto, encouraging everybody to read it. Um, but there's a problem with that. Uh, party leaders today aren't actually interested in class revolution, the jie ji dou zheng. Um, it's, it's really, if you're the, the party leaders really aren't interested in migrant workers, the urban proletariat in Beijing rising up. In fact, the real irony about China today is that the worst fears of the Chinese Communist Party is there actually might be a labor leader out there somewhere in China um, who uh, is interested in organizing or uh, you know, approaching the discontented members of the proletariat to take action. And that's precisely why the uh, Chinese uh, party leaders uh, in the fall, for those of you who find, follow Chinese politics, aggressively moved to tar target some of the wildcat Marxist student groups at Renmin University and other schools uh, in China. 
there were there were some students who might have taken those required greetings a little bit too seriously about you know class, and they started to actually kind of go out and make link up or try to link up with uh, with various workers in in society, and uh, Chinese party leaders looked at that and they said. Uh, well, uh, we actually remember our own history and we're determined not to let anybody else repeat it. Uh, so that's a problem about sort of doubling down on Marxism in an ideological uh, way. So the other move that Chinese leaders are making is to attempt to redefine the party uh, in terms of Chinese tradition and paint it as the logical successor to uh, China's past imperial glories uh, and uh, reassert a more you know, reassert China's own cultural and historical identity. Uh, so you've seen that very clearly in some of the rollout of new textbooks and on the effort to politically rectify academia. For those of you who are Americans who may or may not look at, at you know, China, if you want to understand, of this, understand this, think of it as a Make China Great Again campaign with native overtones and think about, you know, think about our own politics and you're like, oh, I can kind of understand uh, what, uh, what might be going through the upper reaches of the Chinese party. Um, now, I'll make one more point about ideology, which is when you reassert a more clear and closed narrative of what it means to be Chinese, it has another effect. It begins to exacerbate tensions within China among people who fit least well into that narrative. Because of course, China is a very big and a diverse place. Um, and so particularly, it aggravates tensions with people in the borderland regions of China who don't fit as well into the new narrative. And so, for example, first look at Hong Kong. Uh, when Beijing begins to push, you know, Hong Kong, former British colony, uh, Cantonese speaking, as a result of 100 years of British, uh, British rule as well as a you know, semi-democratic system, it has a different identity from mainland China. Uh, uh, and as Beijing began to push political education into the curriculum in sort of 2010-2012 period, what it began to generate was a backlash among young Cantonese-speaking uh, Hong Kong youth. Uh, and that begins to fuel the growth of student groups. It begins to feed into the Occupy Central movements in uh, 2014, the biggest protests since Tiananmen Square. And it leads to a radicalization of an entire generation or a large section of Hong Kong youth, uh, which is very different from where we were 10 or 15 years ago, where Hong Kong was politically pretty inert. It's actually become radicalized. Um, okay, uh, if you want to look at the polar opposite of Hong Kong, think about Xinjiang. Think about the western, you know, the westernmost part of China. Think about a primarily rural and a primarily Muslim area. And think about how when you know, Beijing begins to push um, aggressively on the, uh, the aggressively attempt to control religious identity, uh, aggressively attempt to push secularization. This is an anti-veiling campaign where you're trying to push women not to wear the veil. Similarly, that type of pressure on what the, what the approved identity is, it also generates uh, radicalization among uh, Muslim believers there. And I could point to similar examples with regard to Christianity, where once the state begins to pivot to more, more nativist definition of Chinese, they start looking at quote unquote foreign religions, Islam, Christianity, a much larger one, uh, and it starts to generate conflicts with uh, the pressures in Zhejiang, but now spreading outside of Zhejiang, where there's now much tougher pressures on the churches. None of these are imminent threats to Chinese social stability. It's a couple of tens of millions of believers in each, each, each community. Um, however, it's an indication of how uh, some of the shifts, just compared with 10 or 15 years ago, are beginning to, uh, are beginning to how, how the things are beginning to shift fairly dramatically in the ideological realm. Now let me move on to the political dimension. Uh, and this is the element that is, of course, getting the most interest today because of the constitutional and the, uh, the institutional shifts that are taking place within the party state. So politically, you're seeing a breakdown in what we thought were those established elite norms and practices. Since Xi Jinping's rise in 2012, he's broken with many of those tacit norms, partially institutionalized political norms that I had mentioned, which were established in the early reform period. The fall of former security czar Zhou Yong Kong in 2013 marked a breakdown in tacit reform era norms against targeting top leaders people who had ascended to the Politburo Standing Committee. Uh, previously, the understanding, you go up to the top of the Politburo Standing Committee and then you retire and you're basically immune. He's in 
prison for life. Uh, and they not only targeted him, they also went after his family as well. Um, similarly, a range of ill-defined leadership groups, the Ling Dao Xiao Zhu, uh, over the economy, over national security, have concentrated power, which used to be split among a range of top party leaders, back into the hands of a single individual, namely Xi Jinping himself. Uh, and a long-standing official aversion to anything resembling a cult of personality has been uh, steadily weakened or abandoned uh, as state media is increasingly focusing attention on Xi uh, himself to the exclusion of other leaders. At the moment, it, look, it's not a Maoist cult of personality. It's a whiff of a cult of personality. There's still a big difference between what's going on now and what took place in the, in the, in the, in the Maoist era. But it's important to realize that some of the stuff you're seeing now is quite different from what we would have seen under Hu Jintao, under Jiang Zemin, or even under Deng Xiaoping himself. Okay. Uh, so, and then with, with it, within the past two years, of course, these are the things that people have paid most attention to. You've seen other norms beginning to fall as well. So in the fall of 2017, at the 19th Party Congress, party leaders broke with tradition and failed to name a political successor to Xi as party head. Usually you would have expected as the party general secretary entered his second five-year term and theoretically his final five-year term, there would be a successor to him named. That didn't happen. Uh, and then, of, of course, last year, in the spring of 2018, party leaders moved to amend the Chinese constitution to erase the term limits on, China, on Xi Jinping's role, state government role, as China's president. Both of those moves naturally paved the way for Xi Jinping, should he desire, to serve as the head of China's party and government for decades into the future. And of course, that would represent a rejection, a likely rejection of yet another core reform era norm uh, and a reversion to potentially that single man authoritarian rule, long term single man authoritarian rule that had characterized the pre reform era. What I'm going to do now is I'm just going to flag two other sh political shifts because I know some of you are studying Chinese politics and you're sort of watching for the future. I'm gonna flag two other major norms that are in the process of breaking down that I don't think have received as much attention as, as, as should be paid to them. The second one is starting to get more attention in the press, um, but I, I think I'll, I'll I wanna mention both of these, and I think they represent sort of dangers uh, going forward. The first is a shift that's taking place at the, both the middle and lower levels of the Chinese state, and that's the repartization of the Chinese bureaucracy. What do I mean repartyization? Well, think back to the early reform era. The early reform era had seen the party take a step back from attempting to manage the day-to-day -day affairs of state. That's eroding as well. If you look at the constitutional amendments that were enacted last year, creating a national supervisory commission, uh, what you see is this is creating a new body but in reality, what it is, is the party's disciplinary inspection apparatus in new form uh, as an oversight organ for all state employees. Uh, and note how different this is from, from previously. Previously, the party's, dis the, GWA, the party's disciplinary inspection committee was, at least formally, only authorized to go after party members. What this amendment and the associated, associated legislation do is to create a channel for the discipline inspectors to go after anyone who's receiving a state salary. And that's going to include state, uh, state -owned, uh, employees of state-owned enterprises. It's also going to include university personnel, such as professors. Uh, and that's potentially going to allow some of the black box norms that have already existed within the party apparatus to spread more deeply within the state apparatus as well. Because, of course, the party is, you know, it's, it's this big. The state government, the government itself, is much bigger. And this would be an expansion or a channel for some of the black box norms in the party to begin to go much deeper within the bureaucracy. Uh, or similarly, uh, take a look at the new government reorganization plan, or that's now already gone through, uh, that was uh, released last year as well. What this does is eliminate a whole host of government organs and merge them with their party counterparts. So for example, the State Civil Service Commission uh, is merged with the Party Organization Bureau. Uh, the State Administration of Religious Affairs gets fused with the uh, the United Front uh, uh, Work Department. Now, on the one hand, you can say, ah, this doesn't really matter. Those party guys were always in charge of setting big policy, and that's true. Um, but on the other, it really does matter, because what you're doing is you're kind of erasing a level of the technocrats in the middle, uh, and you're putting the party cadres much more directly back in the driving seat of day-to-day -day operations. Nor is this shift limited to state organs. Uh, 
at some of the events I'm talking about, I'll get more business people. Uh, and what they will note is that they will see uh, new efforts uh, for the party cells, which were previously relatively dormant, that existed, for example, in foreign joint ventures. Uh, there's pressure to sort of renovate and sort of rejuvenate these and give them more voice in respect to, say, personnel decisions or major management ones. Uh, and of course, this is consistent with an effort to sort of, which is Xi Jinping's, you know, he's expressed it, you know, we need to make the party leaders not only ensure absolute leadership, not only in, 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 in the government, but also make sure it's an absolute leader in society as well. And this uh, is precisely how this partial distinction between party and state, which existed over the course of the reform era, starts to collapse and, the, you know, it starts to fuse back into a much tighter unity. Now, I'll mention the second trend uh, that I sort of flagged, and that's the intensification of repression in the China's uh, western region of Xinjiang. This is heavily populated by a Muslim ethnic minority, namely the Uyghurs. Um, of course, concerns about uh, ethnic uh, unrest and border security, Xinjiang borders on the former Soviet Union, now, the, now Russia, uh, or also on Kazakhstan and, and, other, uh, and, uh, and other countries as well, um, have meant as a result of that border, China has already always, Beijing has always wielded a somewhat heavier hand there than elsewhere because they're concerned about security issues. Um, and that control, control was already stepped up once pretty significantly after a major burst of inter-ethnic rioting in 2009 in which both Han and Uyghurs were essentially were killed in you know, inter-ethnic clashes. Um, but since 2017, there's been another qualitative leap in the level of repression. Um, and specifically, Beijing has constructed a web of political re-education camps into which a significant percentage of the Uyghur population, as estimates range from hundreds of thousands to upwards of a million people, have been preemptively disappeared. And state efforts to eradicate identity and religion, shuttering mosques, and creating systems for party cadres to live in Uyghur homes and observe family practices in order to determine are you excessively religious? Are you, you know, are you growing a beard? Um, those have started to be, uh, are those have gained steam. And of course, this is a major human rights issue in and of itself, and one which is now starting to pocket, uh, percolate into the public consciousness. But I'm going to flag something else associated with this. To my mind, this also is the breaking of another crucial reform era norm. And let me just sort of explain this. In pre-reform Maoist society, uh, Maoist China, society was extensively politicized. Broad swaths of the people were politically labeled for bad class backgrounds or overseas family ties. This group might have been the former landlords, former land, you guys were the landless peasants. And that would be a label that would attach to you and would track you. It would determine your ability to get into college or not get into college. It would have an impact on your life. Um, and more or less that effort to sort of stamp labels on people's heads and sort of use it to classify wide, wide, wide swaths of the population, that kind of disappeared with the, end, with the beginning of the reform era. Of course, Beijing still came down on it like a hammer on, into, on dissidents, you know, people who were protesting uh, centr you know, central party leaders or attempting to to you, you know, form labor unions. But, it, but that, that effort to sort of use labels against, against wide swath of the society and pit those groups against each other, that kind of came to an end. Uh, and what specifically worries me with respect to the Xinjiang situation is that I can start to see how such practices might begin to come back um, and how social politicization in China might start to get revived. Um, uh, and those cracks between groups begin to, uh, begin to get manipulated. And so reports suggest that some of those practices which are existing in Xinjiang are now migrating out of just Xinjiang itself into Ningxia, into Gansu, to areas that are not Uyghur but are Hui Muslims, a different Muslim minority. Uh, and once you start to see that, it's, it's, you can start to imagine how some within the party bureaucracy might start to adopt the same mentality, if not necessarily the same practices, with respect to other groups within society that are deemed problematic, uh, say, the large Christian population. And if once you start thinking in that, you can start to see how it might begin to spin from there. Um, okay, so I'm going to stop. Uh, the in, in summary, China is ideologically closing up, it's economically slowing down, and the partially institutionalized political norms of the past several decades are coming, are starting to buckle. I'll move on to sort of some more concluding remarks. Uh, so, you know, one, there are 
couple big questions. One is, why is all this happening? Uh, why are these political norms coming undone? And the core answer that I give in the book is that um, I think because of China's failure to build alternative institutions of governance uh, during the reform era, arising from this dogged adherence to one-party political rule, Xi Jinping now finds himself driven back to yet older methods in order to make change happen. And put yourself in Xi Jinping's shoes. Uh, you are a committed believer in the party's continued dominance. You sense, as you come to power in 2012, that China is slouching towards crisis. Uh, you see a frozen and factionalized political system as you're coming to power in 2012. Uh, you see corruption seeping into the bones of the party itself. What do you do? You viscerally, you know, you, you viscerally reject any move to political liberalization. That's been off the table since uh, 1989. And so what do you do? I think you do what he's doing. You resort to the levers that you do have. You try to centralize power in your own hands. You launch politicized purges of your rivals. You cultivate a populist image among the masses. And you promote an ideological shift back towards nationalism and cultural identity. I'm not saying I like this, but there is a logical step-by-step -step progression to what he's doing and what others around him are doing as well. The second big question is, what does this all mean for the, for the big picture? Um, now, some people are saying, well, you know, she is a new Mao. I don't go that far. There are several key reform era norms that have not yet been broken. And the big one is the any resort to bottom up social mobilization. If you're thinking to the Mao era, you do have to remember that Mao called people out into the streets to attack his rivals. That's, there's no sign of that. There's n everything that's going on in China right now is top down. It's, the effort is to manage things, to control things. You don't want loose actors, even those operating on your behalf, to run around and sort of stir things up. Uh, so that's a key norm that has not yet been broken. But the, key, the core point that I like to make is that the, the reform era itself is unwinding. And once you conclude that the political rules of the game that have you know, governed the past several decades are coming undone, the operative question starts to be, what's the next one that starts to go? Okay. Now, just to be clear, while the story that I'm telling is a China-specific story of political erosion within China's Leninist one-party state, I'm actually not bashing China. The idea that political norms are breaking down should have resonance for those of you who observe other trends worldwide. In fact, if you're looking for parallels within democratic societies, you could look at Turkey, you could look at India, you could look at the Philippines, or you could look at the United States. In fact, if I were an American expert, I might try to tell a story. I might keep the title of my book, at least the first you know, couple words, exactly the same. And I might try to tell a story where the last two decades of the 20th century saw a fusion of money and party politics that led to a steady erosion of American uh, political institutions by the early 21st century. Existing norms began to give way. Bipartisan compromise, Senate rules regarding the use of the filibuster, not shutting the government down for weeks on end. Uh, uh, core leaders began to experiment with ways to make an end run around existing institutions viewed as problematic, uh, such as by declaring a national emergency uh, and concentrating power in their own hands. Uh, American ideology turned uh, closed down. There was a turn against immigration and free trade. There was a slide towards alternative mechanisms of governance, direct communication over Twitter, the use of vaguely defined leadership groups involving son-in-law, uh, the cult of personality over experience, purges of the heads of the domestic security services, the FBI, the diplomatic corps, the State Department, and I could go on and on. Uh, of course, there are crucial differences. Uh, in China, what is taking place is top-down political erosion that's being driven by Xi Jinping and those around him. What's taking place in the United States is bottom-up political erosion fueled by populist pressures on both the left and right. But make no mistake, the risks of what are taking place in China are just as severe, if not more so, than what's taking place in the United States. Because if you're like me and you're worried about what you see here in the United States, I think you have to ask yourself, what happens when you see political erosion take place in a country like China, where the entire institutional political architecture is of much more recent vintage, and the history of much more severe political turbulence is really recent. The Cultural Revolution is only a couple decades in the past. 
And that's why I think what is happening is so risky. Because I think once you start pulling those things, those political rules of the game apart, it's like a Jenga set. The underlying problems that plagued the pre-reform era start pushing themselves, kind of zombie-like, back to the surface again. For example, local officials starting to compete to exalt the top, the top leader. Breakdown in channels of information to the top of the system as people become increasingly unwilling to reflect back negative imp information. Efforts to spread party controls back into areas where they had retreated from in the 1980s. Look at what's happening in Chinese academia just in the last couple of years. Um, an erosion in the technocratic capabilities of the state. More vicious internal score settling within the party as norms continue to break down. And so you want to look for this uh, about some of the language that was deployed against Bo Xilai and Zhou Yongkong and Sun Zhengcai, uh, Zhou and, uh, Xi Jinping's rivals, um, accusing them of plotting a coup. And then you want to look at the announcement of uh, the China's new National Supervisory Commission, uh, that it's Super Supervisory Commission, that it intends to deepen uh, political inspections and intensify its efforts to go after political deviation within the party and state. Uh, and I think if you think about all of that, uh, you, it, all of this spells trouble. Uh, in the short term, I think it bodes for a more hardline, a more personalized authoritarian state. Um, but in the longer term, I think it's a recipe for the revival of the kind of uh, internal political instability that many people thought was gone and buried, uh, dead and buried, since the beginning of the reform era. Uh, so with that, I'll, I'll just close. And I'll mention that I think they're going to make the book available for sale. Hopefully, I think it should be a good discount uh, available. And if you do buy it, it my, my publisher tells me I'm supposed to encourage people to like, write Amazon reviews. So that, that's apparently the new thing that I'm supposed to say. So anyway, I'll stop with that. And uh, thank you guys so much. I mean, anything, ask, ask questions.